All right, shall we begin? Huh? Let's yeah. see if we can finish this essay. I was uh, mentioning for lunch that this is the easiest three sessions I've ever done with you because I have a plan left, mainly reading through an, a major essay, which is something we've never done in the past, which is take a single essay, a long piece of prose, and work through it. And yet that seems to be what's happening here. I was watching last week to see if I saw boredom or wearing out on your faces, and I didn't see any major indications of that. And people afterwards said they would like to continue, so it seems to me maybe we should do that. With Emerson, if we have time, second hour, we'll finish up. We'll go on to do either a poem by Emerson or look at for a moment after all. But uh, we, why not continue with where we were when we left off on uh, Wednesday of last week? We were on page 265, I believe. We have not yet reached the moment of uh, sort of a pastoral uh, exhortation, which Emerson usually reaches. <coughs> it's difficult to teach Emerson's prose because Emerson doesn't write like you and I write. He doesn't have a strongly linear mind that's organized neatly into subcategories and categories. And often a major point will be buried within a sentence, maybe even in a subordinate clause someplace. And so you have to read very carefully to see where he's taking you. Uh, if only at the end, perhaps, I can give you a clue that something important has passed you by. On the other hand, you do notice when you read Emerson's essays that he has a strong remnant of his uh, pastoral days involved. Emerson is a preacher, and he's constantly keeping an eye to the exhortation at the end of the sermon to get you uh, elevated, involved, and to have you leave an essay or a lecture with a feeling of uh, uh, uplift, which is not a point that we have quite yet reached in this, uh, in this particular essay, though it comes at the end. And I'd like to pick up where we were last week and see if we can bring ourselves at least to the, the exhortation that it's not over. In spite of all the rather limiting features we've encountered in this essay, these various frames of mind that limit us, slow us down, that give us a wall, or an angle of vision that we're willing to submit to, whether it's illusion uh, or chance or some other frame of mind. Recall what we were asking of ourselves, is that we see that what Emerson is talking about here are ways of viewing the world, which if we take to ourselves as the truth, will limit us and become what he calls the lords of life. Um, when we, I almost said when the bell rang, there's the teacher's habit. Uh, when we <laughs> ran out of time last week, we were on page 264 and 65, and Emerson was raising a crucial issue, which is part of the gradual evolution to a perception of what we need to remember to keep ourselves alert, growing, and alive. It's on page 264 where he starts uh, this paragraph. Human life is made up of the two elements, power and Power and form. And the proportion must be invariably kept if we would have it sweet and sound. In other words, power is what creates for him. Now, often, words like power are words that have a, a sort of peculiar Emersonian image, different from the way you and I would use them. But power is the creative force. It's expansion, it's growing. Form, for Emerson, is the limiting force. And, and living right is keeping these qualities balanced uh, between ourselves. Now, at this point in the essay, he has been referring to the ability that we would like to see in the world that it be reasonable, that it be planable, that if you organize your life properly, you will have an organized or predictable uh, outcome of any particular event. And much of what he's brought in the essay up to this point has been convincing. If I, uh, if I plan a, a bank account, put money in it, I'll get certain interest, I'll have a certain amount of money at the end. But now he's making his shift away from form and towards power in the essay. And power is going to be very important for him and for us to avoid the uh, narrowing restrictions of what we are. And form, if you recall, is your, your age, your sex, your place in society, all those external restrictions that keep you down. And at this point, the top of page 265, he's shifting away from that to point out that, in fact, even though we may plan and organize, life isn't going to go along with us. 
How easily, if fate would suffer it, we might keep forever these beautiful limits and adjust ourselves once for all to the perfect calculation of the kingdom of known cause and effect. If cause and effect actually worked, how nice it would be for us. If you've been involved in education or in uh, psychology, for example, in the 20th century, you often get these random shots of predictability. Prediction, I guess you'd call it. Uh, he's, he here is presenting us with modern psychology, which is very cause and effect oriented. If you've read B.F. Skinner, uh, Walden II, the cause-effect relationship between uh, intellectual growth and personality. Uh, Freud is part of it, the modern scientific perception of what we are, which turns the human being into nothing more than a stimulus response organism of some kind. Emerson's not going to be in favor of that at all. He says, in fact, the more you go towards cause and effect or stimulus response, the more you realize that the human beings are not willing to be subsumed under those categories. <coughs> In the street and in the newspapers, life appears so plain a business that manly resolution and adherence to the multiplication table through all weathers will ensure success. Is that right? You follow, follow the stock market, keep your multiplication organized, and you'll do well. But ah, presently comes a day, or is it only a half hour, with its angel whispering, which discomfits the conclusions of nations and of years. All this planning. If you remember uh, your history from college, uh, the 19th century was the century that organized his historical studies so that you could see how history developed through cause and effect. Emerson says we may wish that, we may desire it. But in fact, human beings crop up and power crops up and destroys all of our plans, all of our assumptions. Tomorrow, every, again, everything looks real and angular. The habitual standards are reinstated Common sense is as rare as genius, is the basis of genius, and experience is hands and feet to every enterprise. And yet he who should do his business on this understanding would be quickly bankrupt. Remember last week? If you were some simply an unimaginative multiplier dealing with past experience, you'd never become a success. Great success comes from another angle. Power keeps quite another road than the turnpikes of choice and will, namely the subterranean and, invis and invisible tunnels and channels of life. When you read Emerson's underlined circle, words like power, you get clues as to where he's going. It is ridiculous that we are diplomatists and doctors and, and considerate people. There are no dupes like these. I don't know how many of you are married to diplomats or doctors or considerate people. But he says that. It's a, great, it's a great assumption of dupehood to become a doctor or a diplomat. The point is, always one level up from the language of Emerson, as you know already. Uh, these are people who rely upon power, uh, pardon me, upon cause and effect. Doctors or physicians look to cause. Uh, if you smoke so many cigarettes, you get the effect you make of lung cancer. Uh, diplomats are constantly planning with their intellect, aren't they, to, res to cause certain conclusions of human experience. These are dupes. They, they dupe themselves, in essence. Life, he says, is a series of surprises. And I've got that word circled in my own text here. And would not be worth taking or keeping if it were not. So this is another one of the lords of life. Though it's one step closer to reality. That is, if you want to respond properly to life, it's be, be ready for something to surprise you. In yourself, in your own psyche, in the, in the self or psyches of others, or in experience. Not that everything is already planned, organized, one, two, three, four. Be ready for something new. And so surprise becomes one of the lords of life. Very useful to come back to the ones we talked about last week and the week before, you might imagine. God delights to isolate us every day and hide from us the past and the future. We would look about us, but with grand politeness he draws down before us an impenetrable screen of purest sky and another behind us of purest sky. You will not remember, he seems to say, and you will not expect. Is it true? Yeah. Well, most of my uh, major experiences in life came when I was looking in the other direction or planning or expecting something else, and all of a sudden God gives us or gives you individually something surprising. And as people who enter your life, or leave your life, uh, 
new jobs, new children. Right? We've all experienced these things. All good conversation, manners, and action come from a spontaneity which forgets usages and makes the moment great. You know what usage means in this sense? What does usage mean? Custom, tradition, and convention. Right. Nature hates calculators. <laughs> now he's using cal. This is a different or earlier version of the word calculator, though I tend to agree with him. Uh, even in modern terms, I'm going to have that one uh, put on a uh, piece of paper in uh, by uh, Sister Marie, one of my colleagues in calligraphy, and give it to one of my, my calculator teachers, colleagues. What does he mean by calculator? Don't you think nature is very programmable? Are you asking me if I would take the opposite stance? No. Except that for him, you're, this is a real interesting question because you're shifting the terminology. If you say program, you'd have to, I'd have to agree with you. And I think Emerson himself would probably agree with you. But this, his term is calculator. And calculator here means planning ahead. See, nature doesn't plan ahead. Nature is program. Like nature is beast, nature is uh, plants. Our programs in terms of their genetic structures so that at a certain time of the year you'll have baby puppies or lambs, that's program. But yes, but nature does not calculate. That's a big difference. And it is we who calculate and plan ahead. So uh, I have to take a semantic quibble to get out of your answer. Well, wait, wait, you but should really abuse nature. It's all right. I think he agrees. I think, he, I think what it, his point is that if you, if you think of what calculation means to us, okay, and to him, it is, I will plan my life for the next month and a half. Nature does not do that. If a, uh, if a lion is due to produce a cub, that cub is a consequence of a happenstance encounter with another lion. But the lion doesn't plan it, doesn't organize its life, but that in the lion's genes and her genetic structure, it's time for her to mate and have a, have a cub. And there's a big difference there between that and what we do, which is forecast the future, calculate. Now, Emerson doesn't like this idea of our believing that we that we can so control our environment as we calculate the future. It's a very good question to see in how the language works. Usually with Emerson, you have to be heightened in your sensitivity to what a particular word means. And he, he tends to feel that for most of us, one of our major submissions to the Lord, lords of life is planning the future. Uh, where will I be five years from now? don't know. Don't put all your energy towards an assumption which nature or God may not uh, agree is where you will be. Five years ago, I didn't know where I would be today. About the only thing that's the same for me is that I'm still here <laughs> at Women's University Club. But I might have assumed that I would be teaching at the UW. And I would have made a big error. That kind of assumption. Calculation. It was surprise that got me my current job. The happenstance presentation of a student in one of my classes at the university of a person who turned out to be the chairman of the English department at the school that I'm teaching at now. So that's very Emersonian in that sense. Very good question. Does that help? Do you see the point he's making? Yeah. That human quality. Semantic. Yeah, it's all semantic, but powerful semantics. And those, the meaning of those words is, uh, is important here. Nature hates calculators. Her methods are saltatory and impulsive. Man lives by pulses. Our organic mo movements are such, and the chemical and ethereal agents are undulatory and alternate, and the mind goes antagonizing on and never prospers but by fits. We thrive by casualties. Our chief experiences have been casual. Casual here means, uh, means uh, accidental, uh, <coughs> random occurrences. Your best likelihood of thriving is being open to randomness. Most, I think most major scientific discoveries come that way uh, in history. If you've read many, uh, many historians of that, students of that discipline. Even people like Edison, who, who, stri who strive, <laughs> the modern <laughs> term will be strive. <laughs> but even people like Edison often found uh, their genius coming by accident. And if you're open to accident, you can, you can create. If you're if you're simply open to a calculation and planning, often very little comes. 
it's almost a commonplace now, though it's somewhat surprising in Emerson's day. So our chief experiences have been casual. This takes us right back to the earlier uh, passage, remember, where he says the most important days in our life were stuck in between calendar days. If we could plan ahead, we would say, hey, this is a major day for me, but we can't plan ahead and they appear on their own. Even in your own, even in your own life, if you think back, the days that you were most proud to remember or happy to remember are days that you hadn't planned. They just came on their own. The most attractive class of people are those who are powerful obliquely and not by the direct stroke. And there's the, how do you use your power? Come at it at an angle. The, the Romantics strongly believe this. If you remember the Dickinson poem, tell all the truth but tell it slant as the oblique image. Success in circuit lies, too bright for our infirm delight, the truth superb surprise. Getting at things at an angle. Instead of saying, I will tomorrow invent the electric light bulb, how did he do it? If you remember Edison, he did it by, by trying hundreds and hundreds of various uh, filaments. Uh, he didn't plan out which one would work. In fact, the ones he thought would work didn't work. It was an accident that created the right filament for the light bulb, the one that would last. The most attractive people, class of people are those who are powerful, obliquely, and not by the direct stroke. Men of genius, but not yet accredited. One gets the cheer of their light without paying too great a tax. I like that. Theirs is, is the beauty of the bird or the morning light and not of art. In the thought of genius, there is always a surprise, and the moral sentiment is well called the newness, for it is never other. As new to the oldest intelligence as to the young child, the kingdom that cometh without observation. In like manner, for practical su success, there must not be too much design. A man will not be observed in doing that which he can do best. How much, for greater success, how much planning should be presented to us? Uh, this is when I read this, I think immediately of something like McDonald's, which occurred randomly in about 1955 and then expanded randomly, and uh, and then grew to become, become one of the major right, experiences of uh, American countryside. Mainly through lack of planning, I think, for the most part. There's no planning involved. Is that true that a man will not be observed doing that which he can do best? That people, when they are under observation, are more restrained, less, uh, less free to create? Effortlessly, because he's quiet, because he's alone. You don't think so? You suppose the composer, the composer composes better. as a teacher, I think better in front of a crowd. Yeah. And my mind is more acute if I haven't had too many <laughs> beforehand. I don't think, um, I think the majority yeah. of people who are used to a stage always keep that feeling. Well, they speak it out. Of course, would Emerson have an easy response to that? I would say. I think he would. Mm -hmm. He would say that people who are public performers can only be best in front of the public. It's just it's the nature of the work. I suspect he would say that a great poet probably writes best alone, and a great composer writes best alone, free from distractions, in which he can create his own, his own environment. The idea of a performer or an artist uh, on stage in front of people performing best without anyone there defines, defies the very nature of the profession. So, yeah, very true. Oh, I think there's no doubt. No uh, doubt. I, I, I've always said that the best teachers that I've ever known have been egomaniacs. <laughs> and, um, and, and enjoy the stage. Enjoy the power. Mm -hmm. I like standing up and everybody else is sitting down. <laughs> I like having people facing me. Uh -huh. And I insist on it as a teacher in class. I won't allow my students to uh, chat in the back of the classroom, to be uh, aggressively disinterested. I demand their attention. And almost all the teachers I've known have been like that. 
a good teacher. You know, that's what that means. I'm in charge here. <laughs> there are then again some of those teachers who are really uh, very good at that. They apparently want to be there. I think there are egocentric teachers who are inept. gets us away from the essay. I have, a, I have a strong feeling that I've developed over the years that good teaching is, uh, is almost attached to a neutral force called energy. And that great teachers who never see a class who are involved with the material and who think they have something to say are good teachers. That is, people who are, um, who are intensely involved with, with what they're doing. And this is important. Listen, I have something to say. The students will almost always adapt to the personality of the teacher. So that a teacher doesn't have to be body body or aloof or formal or informal. Those are all random qualities of good teachers. But what a teacher must be to be a good teacher is committed to his work. He must say, this is important, this is different. I believe this. There's an excellent essay in the March 28th time magazine that I would uh, urge you to pick up uh, to read on the teaching of literature by Roger Rosenblatt. It's sort of a um, memorial piece to, uh, to Douglas Bush, a Harvard professor that he once had. But it raises that the very essential issue, what is a teacher of literature? What makes a good one? And the Rosenblatt is a superb essay. I don't know much about it, but I know that I've only read about three essays in the last 10 years, and it stuck permanently in my head, and he wrote all three of them. So I have to do some more research on this. Now. This is a very good essay for any teacher to look at. I think the point is passion is what makes Students have no pity on a, on a dispassionate teacher, somebody who doesn't care what he's doing, he's filling in his time. They know right away if you don't care. If you care, it doesn't make any difference what you're teaching. If you're teaching English, they know it's important to you, and they will say, hey, I'm willing to listen. If you're teaching math, if you're teaching history, PE. Um, this is a total, that's another whole lecture on its own. I've, I've, I gradually tried to evolve this because of my own experience with it tremendous variety of teachers who I thought were excellent, from people who were nothing but lecturers, never looked at a class, but who held the interest so intensely that uh, nobody would think of walking out, to people who were the kind who sat down and said, hey, I'm nothing more than one of you, let's rap, <laughs> and still created good classes, uh, because they adapted their pedagogical techniques and their intensity and seriousness of the issue. And I tend to be a more formal teacher than teaching than uh, others, but I'm not seeing the problem with other teachers in your own style, all of who say this is important to me, uh, being good. That's another issue entirely. A man will not be observed in doing that which he can do best. There is a certain magic about his properest action which stupefies your powers of observation, so that though it is done before you, you wist not of it. We've all seen that. People doing something well, and our response being, how did that happen? can't understand because they seem to have a connection with power that you and I don't have. The art of life has a, is that tutancy? Tutancy? And will not be exposed. Every man is an impossibility until he is born. Everything impossible until we see a success. The ardors of piety agree at last with the coldest skepticism that nothing is of us or our work, that all is of God. It's an important sentence for us. That is, Ultimately, when you look at where creativity comes from, the one common conclusion we must have is a conclusion which would attach the most devout Christian with the greatest skeptic. The conclusion is that something is there which isn't of me that makes creativity. You don't have to believe in God to perceive it. And that it comes from some connection, you know, some linkage between individual and power. And you can call that power whatever you like, but it's truly there. Nature will not spare us the smallest leaf of laurel. What does that mean? What is a laurel leaf? Honor, right. You want to take it to yourself and say, hey, I did it. But no great creator, no great artist would say it's his own. It's that he has this link and this is that with something greater. Yes, it's come, you become a conduit. Yes. You become a conduit, yes. 
All writing comes by the grace of God, and all doing by having. I would gladly be moral and keep due meets and bounds, which I dearly love, and allow the most to the will of man. But I have set my heart on honesty in this chapter. I can see nothing at last in success or failure than more or less a vital force supplied from the eternal. Well, there's the sort of humble for himself. The results of life are uncalculable and uncalculable. The years teach many which the days never know. The persons who compose our company converse and come and go and design and execute many things. And somewhat, for us, something comes of it all, but an unlooked for result. The individual is always mistaken. What if that's true? He designed many things and drew in other persons as coadjutors, quarreled with some or all, blundered much, and something is done. All are a little advanced, but the individual is always mistaken. It turns out something new and very unlike what he promised himself. And this gets you right back to that idea of the individual in Emerson standing there and looking, right, and planning and seeing a certain range of vision. But Emerson's constant goal will be for us to break through these barriers and to realize that right, what we are capable of seeing is only a small portion of something far greater than us. So all of our plans are limited by our individual vision. And if you get outside, you will see that there is a unifying force, a power, Emerson's terms, world, soul, we could call it God, or spirit of nature, uh, whatever it is, all of this is something that we constantly must work towards by breaking through the barriers of our own limited, our own limited lives to understand it. We simply can't do it on our own. What you have to have ultimately is, is faith that even though I can only see this far with my vision, right, that there is something I can deduce that will take me this much farther out to understand reality. Our single, individual, limited plans do not suffice. And if we do, then we're suffering under one of these lords of life. We can't plan. We can't plan. The most obvious of all examples, raising our children. <laughs> we have these children, and we raise them, and we organize our lives. And you know, you before they're two years old, you've already planned them to be... Uh, He'll be a doctor just like his dad, and he'll be a lawyer just like his mom. And, uh, and the kids go up to become rock musicians all on their own. And your plans simply have to be thrown out into the void for whatever nature or God or other people will uh, insist on them. filled with books, new and old books. Uh, I could not get my son to, uh, to learn to read until he went to first grade, and his first grade teacher taught him, taught him to read in three months. You know, I read him every night stories. I would try to sound out the sounds. You know, hey, this is important to daddy. I want you to be a great reader. Uh, no, it wasn't his dad that was going to teach him to read. It was Mrs. Wood who put the pressure on and created it. Or himself. But I think a lot of it is resistance of parents. Uh, kids will do things for teachers they will never do for parents, like be kind and considerate and polite. <laughs> <laughs> things like that. So he's going to make another uh, step now in the next paragraph here where he moves towards what, he, what we will call reality for him. The ancients, struck with this irreducibleness of the elements of human life through calculation. In other words, life refuses to be organized calculated, put in nice categories. They exalted chance into a divinity. We're talking now about antique religions. But that is to stay too long at the spark, which glitters truly at one point. So he says that when you take something like chance or randomness, it's evident in pre-Christian in, in pre cultures that this was so obvious to uh, earlier religions that chance became part of their structure of divinity, of divinity, so that the Hindus would have a place for it. And Emerson was very well aware of Western, pardon me, Eastern religions. He says, but if you 
take this randomness of, pheno of phenomena as a divinity, then you stay too long there. And here's that danger of the Lords of Life. You say, ah, I see a solution to these other problems is to break through expectations and continuity and to say, ah, things will change of their own accord. And we have to adapt to uh, accident, happenstance. He says, then you make this a rule of life which is in itself a lie or a law. So we have to break through that. But what that is to stay too long at the spark, which glitters truly at one point, but the universe is warm with the latency of the same fire. A miracle of life which will not be expounded but will remain a miracle introduces a new element. Here's a little clue. Something else is coming up. In the growth of the embryo, Sir Everard Holm, I think, I think it might be from us here, I'm not sure. I think noticed that the evolution was not from one central point, but coactive from three or more points. Life has no memory. That which succeeds proceeds in succession might be remembered, but that which is coexistent or ejaculated from a deeper cause, as yet far from being conscious, knows not its own tendency. So it is with us, now skeptical or without unity, because immersed in forms and effects all seeming to be of equal yet hostile value, and now religious, whilst in the reception of spiritual law. Bear with these distractions, with this coetaneous, coetaneous growth of the parts, they will one day be members and obey one will. That's very dense prose, right? Almost impossible to understand. But in essence, what he's saying is something very simple. And that is that we tend to see experience going across the line, we're moving along in our life, and something interrupts. We're able to see that. And then to adapt to that, maybe send off at a new angle. But Emerson says if you take it as a simple interruption, you will be confused by what reality is, because reality is, in effect, varieties of experiences going on at the same time, each one growing on its own. In other words, simply, life is not linear. It's, it's, much, it's quite easy to look back and say, ah, here I encountered a deflection from my plan. A uh, chance happenstance occurred. Now I know where I'm going, and then I will encounter another one. You're still perceiving life as essentially linear. But Emerson's key point is that as you grow and change or experience life, what's happening is that you have a, lo a, a variety of growing and changing points. They're not linear. And so you move over here, you see something happening. Over here, you see something else. What you do not see is the history. And that confuses us. In order to understand what life is really like, you have to believe that all of these things, all of these various experiences, take place in the context of some unifying uh, experience. Hard to find language to fit it. Some unifying force. So that while varieties of experiences take place to us, there is a continuity, but it's not linear. It's not, it's not a direct line. Does that make sense? Yeah, life is not like a, like a uh, string of gunpowder. You put a match to one side and you come to an inevitable conclusion. Uh, more likely, it's a, it's a series of piles of gunpowder that are set next to each other. You start one here, you start one here, you start one here. And then the real perception of it is a, is a unifying of all of these things. And you must have faith that even though all we can see is this or this or this, as they touch in our lives, there's something that ties them all together. Emerson is constantly asking us to avoid this linear perception. He doesn't believe much in, in linearity. So he says, so it is with us, you see, now skeptical or without unity. Well, where's the unity in these random changes, random experiences? Makes us skeptical, doesn't it? Because we're immersed in forms and effects all seeming to be of equal yet hostile value. And you know this yourself, as elements in our life appeal to us, they often are contradictory or of equal value. What shall I do? Shall I do this or do that? Well, they're both equally attractive, but they don't live together in the same world. Am I a, am I a, a 
schiz schizoid, schizophrenic. So we see all of these various experiences. And now religious, whilst in the reception of spiritual law, bear with these distractions in experience. With this coetaneous growth, as the various parts of your personality are developing and changing, they will one day be members and obey one will. Here you see is that part of that religious, uh, preacher-like quality. Have faith. They all come out. You will coalesce into a person. Life will coalesce into a into a unity, though individual experiences don't seem to be moving in that direction. On that one will, on that secret cause, they nail our attention and hope. Life is life is hereby melted into an expectation or a religion. <clears throat> Ultimately, though Emerson gave up the thought, quit becoming a minister, quit his preaching. He's very religious in his uh, demands on us. You have to have faith that there is a structure behind it all, that there is a, a relationship that, that it is one. Underneath the inharmonious and trivial particulars is a musical perfection, the ideal journeying always with us, the heaven without rent or seam. You know what rent means? Yeah. The tear, right. You have to believe in that. If you're writing, if you keep marginal notations, you have to underline or, or score by the margin those lines. You have to believe ultimately that something, at any time Emerson capitalizes a word he's stressing, is that ideal unity that <coughs> gets itself into and through and around what seem to be the contradictory particulars of life. They're all parts of something much more important than that. Do but observe the mode of our illumination. In other words, with light. When I converse with a profound mind, how do, you, how do you find yourself illuminated, awakened intellectually? What's it like? Let's look at it as an example of this. When I converse with a profound mind, or if at any time being alone I have good thoughts, I do not at once arrive at satisfaction, as when being thirsty I drink water. Hear the comparison? You're thirsty, you drink a glass of water, and you're not thirsty anymore. He says when you talk with somebody, or when you think, towards expansion of your mind. You don't become satiated the way you do with the, with the food, with the food of water. Or go to the fire, being cold. When you go to the fire, what happens? You get warm. Yes. No, I am at first apprised of my vicinity to a new and excellent region of life. That is, he says, when you get near expansion of yourself, your ideas. You become aware that there's something greater than what life is like every morning, every day, every afternoon. It's the growing, changing evolution of your intellect, of your mind. By persisting to read or to think, this region gives further sign of itself, as it were in flashes of light, in sudden discoveries of its profound beauty and repose as if the clouds that covered it parted at intervals and showed the approaching traveler the inland mountains with the tranquil eternal meadows spread at their base whereon flocks graze and shepherds pipe and dance. But every insight from this realm of thought is felt as initial and promises a sequel. Most of you, I think, recall those days when you were in college and you came across disciplines or teachers who just cracked open your brain and showed you possibilities you'd never thought about the great excitement of education, to start thinking in manners you have never thought before. See ideas, realms of ideas that open up your mind, your personality. He says, the, the, the main emotional response is, I am just beginning, just beginning to see, taking out, grow. Not satiation then, but expansion. I do not make it. I arrive there and behold, what was there already? You get to an idea, and then the professor says, ah, great first step. One of my techniques as a teacher with my students is to ask a question which has a fairly uh, simple, obvious answer. And when I do it, I'll say, well, what, what do you suppose is going on with this? And I'll get my a sophomore and raise a hand. I'll say, ah, very good. Now go on. Right? And they go on. I thought I answered the question. <laughs> well, no, you're just beginning. Where, where do you go from here? And many of them very, have very seldom come across teachers who say, all right, that's a good beginning. Where can you take it? And then maybe I'll give, a, give them an example of how you start 
thinking about literature, pushing it, not stopping, not taking it as something completed and whole and finished, but as a first step. And that sense, as you watch their eyes open up, and they say, well, maybe I could say this. Yes, good, but keep on going. Well, <laughs> right? right? Like, like someone being pushed out into an ocean without any oars in a boat and not knowing where they're going to end up. But it's exciting to them, even at the age of 15. Keep pushing out there, finding something going on. I arrived there. Behold what was there already. I make. Oh, no. I clap my hands in infantine joy and amazement before the first opening to me of this august magnificence, old with the love and homage of innumerable ages, young with the life of life, the sunbright mecca of the desert. And what a future it opens. I feel a new heart beating with the love of a new beauty. I am ready to die out of nature and be born again into this yet this new yet unapproachable America I have found in the West, since neither now nor yesterday began. These thoughts, which have been ever, nor yet can a man be found who from their first entrance knew. If I have described life as a flux of moods, I must now add that there is in us which changes not and ranks all sensations and states of mind. You see, there is that Emerson shift. If I said life is, right, changes of moods, I uh, respond to the way I, to the life in terms of the way I feel today. So if I'm depressed, the world is depressing. If I'm happy, the world is, uh, is, uh, is joyful. He says, if I must say that there are such things as moods which limit our perception of the world around us, I've got at the same time, right, to say that there is something which does not, right, Something does not change. He's pushing us now towards his ultimate uh, conclusion here. You might be, as you read Emerson, thinking or remembering other romantic poets and writers who raised issues like this. Um, it's hard to read Emerson, especially this essay. And this part of the essay that I'll think is something like uh, Wordsworth's old on uh, of immortality, where Wordsworth sets that romantic perception of going back towards the knowledge that we once had, and that all of us as human beings living in this world realize we've really lost something rather than gained something. And so we have a reminiscent connection with truth, with ideality, with permanence. And much of the adult being the effort to go back to find that connection which we lost when we were born into, <coughs> into our individuality. Fortune. Minerva, Muse, Holy Ghost. These are quaint names, too, nar too narrow to cover this unbounded substance. What do we call what connects, ties them together? The baffled intellect must kneel before this cause, which refuses to be named. You notice, by the way, the uh, element of uh, slight here towards uh, modern Christianity. He equates Holy Ghost with Muse, Fortune, and Nerva, classical uh, mythological uh, concepts. Ineffable cause, which every fine genius has essayed to represent by some emphatic symbol, as Thales by water, and Aximenes by air, and Exagoras by Nulos, I believe, uh, thought, Zoroaster by fire, Jesus and the moderns by love. The metaphor of each has become a national religion. What's he saying? There is something that is permanent. Almost all religions and philosophies have striven to find a term for what connects. Right? If you're a Heraclitus, you call it change. If you're uh, an Exagoras, you call it thought. If you're Zoroaster, you call it fire. If you're a Christian, you say love. That's at the heart of the core. Do you remember Walt Whitman in the Song of Myself, where when he tries to define what links all the tremendous variety in life, it comes down to, to love. Love is the, the, the attractive force that binds us all. The Chinese Mencius has not been the least successful in his generation. And he quotes I fully understand language 
and nourish well my fast-flowing vigor. I beg to ask what you call fast-flowing vigor, said his companion. The explanation, replied Mencius, is difficult. This vigor is supremely great and in the highest degree unbending. Nourish it correctly, do it no injury, and it will fill up the vacancy between heaven and earth. This vigor accords with and assists justice and reason and leaves no hunger. In our more correct writing, we give to this generalization the name of being. In a, but in our more correct writing, he's saying, in, in the terminology of the Western culture, for us, we call this, and he uses a capital, capitalized version of being, our essence, our essay in life. And thereby confess that we have arrived as far as we can go. In other words, Emerson says, when we come to this, we don't have language. We lose language. Or we call it being. Or we call it God. Nature. But being is probably the, the best. The verb to be is the, is the universal verb. It has its own operation in the language. And, and it means the sense of existence. Suffice it for the joy of the universe. The series that Emerson is going to ask us endlessly to go on, to break through. Being is creativity, it's change. And like Whitman, who's somewhat of an Emerson acolyte, I suppose we call him, creativity is constant change. Endless going on, never settling down, not putting a wall around our concepts, around ourselves. And the key word here, of course, is right, is joy. Right? Suffice it for the joy. It's not that the universe is satisfied. It's not a, suffice it for the definition of the universe. Suffice it for it's everything. Ultimately, for Emerson, is going to work towards joy. This is the way it has to be. And you should rejoice in it. Yes. It, no, that's right. If you, as soon as you stop, that's right. That's right. You can you keep striving in terms of your essence of self, and you strive in terms of your understanding and knowledge. And so you work towards it. The person who stops moving stops living for Emerson. I, don't, I think if he said it, he said if you thought it would be, you have misinterpreted what being is, because being is. But in terms of satisfaction, I think it would be definitely. <laughs> but he would say no, no, no. I would never want to know so well that I've got it in my grasp, that I've owned it, possessed it. But if you did carry it, would be static, and okay. then it ceases to be being. That's right. But then That's you right. realize it was static, and you know that you weren't there, so you continue to pick it up. If you're sensitive, you'll know the moment you think you've got it that you haven't got it. That's right. That's right. And you'll say, I'm glad I've got another another step to go at this. Um, okay, let's go. Our life seems not present so much as perspective. There's the point. Right? You think you've got life, you settle down, you've got your house in Mercer Island, and your four cars, and your right, 500,000 a year coming in, and your children are all perfect. Um, <laughs> I mean, Emerson says, no, as are we. He says, as soon as you reach that moment of satisfaction, you, right, you have to be looking to the future constantly. So life is not what you own or what you have or possess, but where you are going, what uh, road you're on. Not for the affairs on which it is wasted, but, that, but as a hint of this vast flowing vigor. Most of life seems to be a mere advertisement of faculty Information has given us not to sell ourselves cheap, that we are very great. So in particulars, our greatness is always in a tendency or direction, not in an action. And there's the point again. What have I done that's really good? Have you written a great book? Well, that's something you did. What are you doing now? What have you done for me lately is, uh, is very Emersonian. What direction are you heading in? Where are you going? Well, never, he doesn't believe in anything such as his old age. Everything's going 
Well, he believes in it as a physical phenomenon. Yes, yes, yes. yes but physical, but not and, and if you go back to the, perm, the poem Terminus, what he would say is, yeah, I know I'm not going to be running up and down stairs when I'm 105, but what I am going to be doing is going in the same direction. Yes. I'm not going to sit down and put myself in a wheelchair and say, well, Ralph, you've done your duty, because that's giving up and dying, yes. definitely. Okay, let's pause here for uh, five minutes so you can have your coffee. I thought I saw the coffee coming out. Is it there? Okay. We'll pick up in a few minutes. All right, yes. Willie Loman says attention must be paid. <laughs> Let's uh, finish the essay uh, this hour. We're a couple of pages away, so we should make some time this uh, second hour. So he says, in particular, our greatness is always in a tendency or a direction, not in action. It is for us to believe in the rule, not the exception. See, one of the dangers for us is to be more aware of exceptions in life than the rule. You know, keeping that, in a sense, keeping the faith, isn't it? The noble are thus known from the ignoble. So when accepting the leading of the sentiments, it is not what we believe concerning the immortality of the soul or the life, but the universal impulse to believe. That is the material circumstance and is the principal fact in the history of the globe. Some of this, by the way, just with a moment's pause, you can see it could be quite shocking in the 1860s, 1870s. His point is it doesn't make any difference to him what church you go to or even what religion you belong to. He says the essential fact of human life that's important to us to understand what it is to be human is that all human beings have the impulse to believe in something. They can call it Allah if they like. I don't know how many of you saw, uh, saw Gandhi. Music box. It's a wonderful movie, but much of what Gandhi says uh, in that film to us is out of the Emersonian, as you might imagine, Theravian tradition. Gandhi says, "I am a Christian. I am a Buddhist. I am a Muslim. I am a Hindu." Uh, and Gandhi very much is responsive to this idea of what unites us is our desire to believe, whatever our terminology is, and even uh, and even Christians recognize passages in. In uh, St. Paul's letters, which refer to uh, to the uh, need in the heart of all people to believe in God, judging those who don't know uh, intellectually by their heart. We all have this according to uh, even Christian doctrine. And he says it is the material circumstance. That means simply it is the one important element for us to consider. So that's the circumstance that's worth thinking about. Shall we describe this cause as that which works directly? The spirit is not helpless or needful of immediate organs. He says, this cause, this need to believe, works immediately, directly. It doesn't have to use all kinds of intermediary uh, methods, techniques. It has plentiful powers and direct effects. I am explained without explaining. I am felt without acting and where I am not. This is what he's talking about in terms of art and genius and creativity. That's what you're sensing is the immediate confrontation with genius. When you come to a great work of art, you don't you don't rely so much on the artifact as upon the connection that offers you as an immediate conduit with genius. So it isn't seeing uh, the Mona Lisa. It's not the Mona Lisa. It's not Hamlet. You go back to the American scholars. You don't study Hamlet because of the play. You study Hamlet, or you look at Mona Lisa, because that shows you creativity in, in, in action. It's not the artifact, it's what it connects with. So it's an immediate conduit then with what we call being, genius, creativity, change. Uh, that's what's important. Otherwise, Hamlet is just a, a yellowed, wrinkled, crumbling manuscript falling apart in some museum. But when you read it and you see creativity, then you know you've touched something that you have in yourself. Therefore, all just persons are satisfied with their own praise. They refuse to explain themselves and are content that new actions should do them that office. They believe that we communicate without speech and above speech, and that no right action of ours is quite unaffecting to our friends at whatever distance, for the influence of action is not to be measured by miles. Why should I fret myself because a circumstance has occurred which hinders my presence where I was expected? If I am not at the meeting, my presence, where I am, should be as useful to the commonwealth of friendship and wisdom 
as would be my presence in that place. The very fact that you chose to be there. He says, why, why is it that if I'm supposed to be someplace, I'm not upset and I'm nervous? When I'm coming over here from school, I'm always nervous coming across the bridge before I get there. I think, well, I get an accident and they'll be waiting and, and I'll be an hour late. And so I go out of my way to be here well before time so that I'm... Uh, but Emerson's point is that wherever else I am is just as fine. Why do I need? Uh, why do I need to be someplace because of external influence? He might be expecting. He might be supposed to be contributing something. But, he, but, but his point would be, I'm contributing wherever I am. Oh dear. Right. The person I. <laughs> now he wasn't thinking. <laughs> <laughs> that takes an awful lot of conceit, oh, yeah. though. It, that's right. He says you must be sufficient where you are. That is, you worry because of what other people will be losing, or failing to gain because of your being there, or what you'll be failing to gain. Not, not, not in the context of what he's saying here. And he's not yeah. thinking about being stuck in the middle of the, the uh, Evergreen Point Bridge either. He's <laughs> saying with other people. His point essentially is if I'm here, I'm supposed to be here at 1 o'clock, and I find myself at school uh, with uh, 15 students who have a certain need, uh, I should be willing to be where I am, regret being where I'm not, but be satisfied with the people around me. This, this has to do with that sense of external validation of self. I don't need it, he says. Isn't that assuming that you're very valuable everywhere you go? He believes it. Oh, no. Yeah. And he believes he's very, very valuable. <laughs> yeah. He kept his schedule right down the line. Yeah. You have to make a distinction between a statement like this, which is, to, is expected to do exactly what it's doing, which is discomfort you, uh, as an audience, you would be uncomfortable if you had gone out of your way to attend an Emerson lecture and he didn't show up and he said, well, I was having such a good time at the hotel, I thought this is as good company as coming to see you. Of course, he wouldn't do that. He was very considerate of people. But he is talking about your willingness. This is philosophical as opposed to practical. Your willingness to be where you are. To be where you are. Oh, if, if you can't be someplace else. Yeah. And even practically, by the way, uh, what am I supposed to do if I'm supposed to be here at... Uh, quarter to 12, and I'm stuck on the other side of the Evergreen Point Bridge. I mean, what should my emotional response be? But if that was through no fault of your own, right. then you would have to accept it. You should be writing a sonnet, but not wasting a sonnet. I don't write sonnets, unfortunately. <laughs> I read them, but but yes, right. It, it, the point is, I know what I would be. I would be just tearing my hair off because I'm a... That's uh, terrible. Uh, but what, what do I do? No, but... That's what he would say. But relax. If you can't be someplace else, you'll be where you are anyway. Right? So don't worry about it. <laughs> but I, I really like his comment here because I have a tendency to be very, very uh, over-responsive. Yeah, in practical terms, he does not. But Gary, okay, you're going to be in Evergreen Point Bridge at 1 o'clock. Let's say you Albert, did you forget the class? And you go right back and say, why should I fret myself because the circumstances occurred where I was expected? That's right. What kind of a... That's what he'd do if he were Emerson. And she would say, you wouldn't have to fret yourself anymore. Fret yourself the next year. That's right. But we won't have you again. This is uh, typical of Emerson. This is typical Emerson comment, isn't it? That is, he wants exactly what he wants. This is uh, but this is typical Emerson comment, isn't it? That is, he wants, he wants exactly the response you're getting, which is an immediate sort of negative that Emerson overstatement, uh, in practical terms, he was the most courteous of gentlemen, as you know. He would never allow ordinary interference. But he's talking about a situation where something does interfere. He says something interferes. Right? Yes. Right? So if there's an accident on the Evergreen Point Bridge, right, he, as opposed to willing an interference or a casual, he's not talking about casual interference. But if I have to be willing to sit on that bridge sometimes because it's going to happen. I, I have to take it every day home from work. And the only way to retain my low breath blood pressure and to be peace, peaceful <laughs> in my mind is to sit there for an hour sometimes. Do you leave a book in your car? Always. I don't go any place without a book. I've got a Graham Green novel in the car right now. <laughs> just in case. I do. I wouldn't go any place without a book. And that's one way that I yeah. I just say fortunes of war. I say it over and over again. You probably hope to be healthy. Well, right now I'm in a really good part of this novel. So <laughs> wouldn't, wouldn't do me any harm. My wife was wondering, I took her along with me to the movie last night. She said, <laughs> you know, why, why are you taking the book along? 
this happens to be the human factor. Mm -hmm. fairly recent. Really? So, um, uh, it was the Pirates of Van. It was wonderful. Uh, if, you, if you like Gilbert and Sullivan, you should go up to the press now. It, it's uh, in uh, Panascope Vision Double, whatever it is, and Dolby Stereo. The music is just incomparable. It's like being in the, right in the orchestra. With, uh, uh, but it wasn't a very big crowd last night. At the exit? Yeah. Well, it's still up at the crest. And it's, uh, I it might be. It's up at 165th and 5th Northeast. So just take 5th straight up all the way. But it, it's a, if you like Gilbert and Sullivan, the music is just absolutely delightful. <laughs> says the movie's better than the play version. <laughs> it's really delightful. My wife says that the two men who play uh, Frederick and the uh, <coughs> pirate captain are two of the most handsome men she's ever seen in all of her life. <laughs> okay. Uh, why should I fret myself? Because a circumstance has occurred which hinders my presence where I was expected. If I am not at the meeting, my presence where I am should be as useful to the commonwealth of friendship and wisdom as would be my presence in that place. I exert the same quality of power in all places. In, in, in practical terms for me, it means I teach as hard to my sophomores as I would to you or to, or to graduate students if you do. But if you do, you do what you do well at all times. Don't diminish, minimize yourself. Not to say that you don't teach poorly at times, too. But you do your best. Thus journeys the mighty ideal before us. It never was known to fall into the rear. No man ever came to an experience which was satiating, but his good is tidings of a better. Onward and onward, there is a constant motion which he and Pippin talk about. In liberated moments, we know that a new picture of life and duty is already possible. The elements already exist in many minds around you of a doctrine of life which shall transcend any written record we have. The new statement, will comprise the skepticisms as well as the faiths of society and out of unbeliefs a creed shall be formed. For skepticisms are not gratuitous or lawless, but are limitations of the affirmative statement, and the new philosophy must take them in and make affirmations outside of them, just as much as it must include the oldest beliefs. I like this, by the way. I've got it sort of triple mark. It, he's, he's saying that as, as belief, understanding, evolves, what we do is gradually take in disbeliefs into beliefs. That is a skepticism in a current time in, in society, in a religious uh, or scientific sense, is something that must be accommodated to move toward truth. And so there is this constant evolution of uh, perception in the world around you so that you take in what doesn't fit. I tell my students that the uh, the a proper perception of a scientific frame of mind is one which is never satisfied with the current truth. That is, scientists do not own truth, they seek truth. And it's a crucial difference. No, no good scientist is going to sit in his comfortable chair and say, I have discovered the truth of whatever his discipline might be. Because that's the end of science. And what good scientists know is that all they are is at a current position of understanding. And so a theory of optics, for example, could, could suffice for several hundred years until certain skepticisms or questions of optics were no longer satisfied by that theory, and then you get an, a leap of perception to satisfy. We were using uh, human reproduction in my sophomore class when this, when this issue came up. For centuries, the theory of reproduction that sufficed in Europe was one which imagined that in the male sperm, there was a, a tiny human being called the homunculus, which was planted in the female and nourished by the female and produced. And for, for several hundred years, that sufficed to answer the questions of what human reproduction was. Uh, eventually, questions were raised. That theory did not suffice any longer. And we got new theories which assumed the skepticisms. So a good scientist is always willing to perceive a radical change uh, we may be totally wrong today about our understanding of what gravity might be. It's 
sort of mysteries, isn't it? Uh, though we have sufficient theory to use in our own daily needs for an understanding of what gravity is. But in, in the future, we may find that something radical may take place to change our whole understanding of it. And flight, maybe a few uh, areas, radically change. You see the point? That is, if something satisfies you, like the theory of the homunculus, so that all of your society's needs are met by that theory, you don't need a, a more refined theory of reproduction. That's good enough. But eventually, questions will be raised, skepticism will be raised, and a theory which is insufficient will have to be changed or broadened to take in the questions. Uh, this has happened in mathematics in this century, hasn't it? And it's happened in physics in this century. And it's happened in psychology in this century, and psych psychiatry. So of all centuries when we should not believe in the absolute ownership of truth, this is the century that we should, we should look to. And yet, for some reason, our co high school students coming to people like me tend to believe that scientists know the truth. But good scientists search for the truth, try to find theories to adapt to it. This is very Emerson. You keep looking for answers keep going. It is very unhappy, but too late to be helped, the discovery we have made that we exist. <laughs> but, well, what can we do about it? Well, here we are already. That discovery is called the fall of man. Ever afterwards, we suspect our instruments. We have learned that we do not see distinctly, but immediately. And that, what does mediately mean? Right. No, it, it, no, it's through mediation. Here, right? And it's so, right, I, was, I got some water on my glasses. Now I can see nobody. Right? <laughs> my, my own family could be sitting here and I wouldn't know you. I can, in other words, I cannot see well with my own eye. I can only see through mediation. Now I see. And, and this is it's a sad truth that most of us face. <laughs> And that we have no means of correcting these colored and distorted lenses, which we are, or of computing the amount of their errors. Now we're moving to the last of these laws of life, which is subjectiveness. Right? Since I can only see with my glasses or through mediation, there's no way I can correct the failure of my glasses, if there is a failure, uh, to get me in tune with the truth. It's even more evident with me. Well, I, I have glasses that are the uh, automatic tinting kind. So when I go outside in the sun, they darken. Um, it, that means that I never see during a summer day when I'm outside the world in its uh, unmediated uh, lack of color. It's always darker to me than it is to somebody without glasses. And I can't do anything about it because if I want to see without that shading, I can't see anything. So th these glasses are a good example of Emerson's point. We have learned that we do not see directly, but immediately, and that we have no means of correcting these colored and distorting lenses which we are, or of computing the amount of their errors. Perhaps these subject lenses have a creative power. Perhaps there are no objects. Once we lived in what we saw, now the rapaciousness of this new power, which threatens to absorb all things, engages us. Nature, art, persons, letters, religions, objects, successively tumble in, and God is but one of its ideas. How do you make a distinction here, then? All of this is coming into us, and he gives a huge list, including God, <laughs> which is one of those ideas that come to us. Nature and literature are subjective phenomena. Every evil and every good thing is a shadow which we cast. The street is full of humiliations to the proud as the fop contrived to dress his bailiffs in his livery and make them wait on his guests at table, so the chagrins which the bad heart gives off his bubbles at once take form as ladies and gentlemen in the street. Shopmen or barkeepers in hotels and threaten or insult whatever is threatenable and insultable in us. It is the same with our idolatries. People forget that it is the eye which makes the horizon and the rounding mind's eye which makes this or that man a type or representative of humanity the name of hero or saint. Jesus, the providential man, is a good man on whom many people are agreed that these optical laws shall take effect. The theologians have had a real over that path, isn't it? Yes, definitely. By love on one part and by forbearance to press objection on the other part, 
it is for a time settled that we will look at him in the center of the horizon and ascribe to him the properties that will attach to any man so seen. What does Jesus then say in his concept of, of his utility for people? Well, Christ becomes the figure on whom we focus to give definition and form and meaning to life. So that I see a good man, I say, ah, there is a Christian. He is our, he is our conduit, our understanding. It might be Buddha in another context for Emerson, because Emerson is not by any means a, an orthodox Christian. But he sees the importance of Christ as that conduit of meaning. I think, by the way, this is a very uh, 20th century concept in many ways. But the longest love or aversion has a speedy term. In other words, nothing lasts long. And its term means length. The great and crescive self, rooted in absolute nature, supplants all relative existence and ruins the kingdom of mortal friendship and love. Marriage in what is called the spiritual world is impossible because of the inequality between every subject and every object. The subject is the receiver of the Godhead, and at every comparison must feel his being enhanced by that cryptic night. What's the trouble with marriage at a higher level than just the physical kind of marriage? It makes a connection between two selves. It has to do with, the, what he says, the inequality. Somebody has to be the loved and somebody has to be the loving. Somebody has to be dominant, somebody has to be uh, submissive in relationships. So when you move up into higher levels, that kind of union of equalities doesn't exist. This raises a whole other issue, as so much of Emerson does, for contemplation. Though not in energy, yet by presence, this magazine of substance cannot be otherwise than felt, nor can any force of intellect attribute to the object the proper deity which sleeps and wakes forever in every subject. Never can love make consciousness and ascription equal in force. There will be the same gulf between every me and thee, and between the original and the picture. The universe is the bride of the soul. All private sympathy is partial. Two human beings are like globes, which can touch only in a point, and whilst they remain in contact, all other points of each of the spheres are immersed. Their turn must also come. And the longer a particular union lasts, the more energy of efficacy the parts not in union acquire. Could stop and talk for about half an hour about that <laughs> paragraph. It's a difficulty that we have as individuals. And that is that people, when they attach themselves to each other, can only attach themselves to each other in very limited and narrow ways. And that uh, marriages, of course, is, is the, the great issue here. Marriages that last a long time, unless they are constantly growing and changing. If, uh, if they are only limited to a single contact of similarity, are going to find, us, find that around the areas, the areas not in contact, are greater and greater urgencies. So a marriage to last, for Emerson, has got to be one which grows and changes. And instead of being static, uh, molded together in one or two areas, has to be constantly growing so that all areas of personality are working at the same time together. So, for example, if you marry somebody and your prime reason for marrying, say, is that you go to the same church and have the same religious beliefs, and that cements you together as a couple, um, you better also have interests aside from that if you're going to survive. Because while you are cemented together, say, in religion, your interest in literature may go this way and this way. Your interest in, let's say, child rearing, one person has this, another one this way. Your interest in uh, in um, the kind of house you like to live in, goes this way, goes that way, interest in jobs. Uh, one becomes more devout, the other one becomes less. And so that you find you're thinning and thinning as you grow until you have such a thin connection that there's nothing to talk about anymore. Um, and this is normal in life. You know, I, when I was first married, my wife and I did everything together. We talked all the time. We've been married 17 years now, and, uh, and each of us has grown all business in our own areas, we still have a pretty good marriage, but it's not that sense of oneness that newlyweds have, where all areas of the other person's interests are are similar. So it's a real danger in marriage that you that you grow away from each other. And almost universally common, I think I say. Any comments on that? 
you see that? I think he said what he would say, you'd have to do to grow closer, is avoid cementing together at one spot. Uh, in one, it could be anything, it could be fishing together, which is your one contact. But I think in most marriages, it's children. I think most of us know marriages that are strongly cemented together because of the children, because they love the children equally and, and have the same good wishes for the children, but which as the children grow up and as the people in the marriage grow and expand, children go away eventually. Um, you have to grow together in other areas than children. And then the children grow up and go away, and there's nothing left. Yeah. The, um, my wife and I went through Marriage Encounter, which is a, a Catholic church phenomenon of the last 15 years. And the essential message of Marriage Encounter to marriages is that you must make your marriage uh, supreme above all other interests, including children and jobs, because those things change. And if you subordinate your marriage to your children, your children will grow up and go away, and the marriage won't be there when they're gone. So it's an interesting phenomenon. Very hard to live up to, by the way. <laughs> Very hard. Life will be imaged, but cannot be divided nor doubled. Any invasion of its unity would be chaos. The soul is not twin-born, but the only begotten. And though revealing itself as child in time, child in appearance, is of a fatal and universal power, admitting no co-life. Every day, every act betrays the inconcealed deity. We believe in ourselves as we do not believe in others. This is an interesting paragraph, by the way. He's saying something very simple. That is, the one absolute belief you have is in the primacy of your own soul and your own spirit. It could be something as simple as Descartes, I think, in some ways. And all he could boil it down to was, I think and therefore I am, remember? Nothing else can you have any substance in it. Well, I know that I exist. I have suspicion that you exist, but I don't know it. But primacy will be my own sense, my own ego. And he, he pushes on to say some interesting things in this paragraph. We permit all things to ourselves, and that which we call sin in others is experiment for us. Is that right? <laughs> you're, you're a sinner, but I couldn't help myself. It is an instance of our faith in ourselves that men never speak of crime as lightly as they think. Or every man thinks a latitude safe for himself, which is no wise to be indulged to another. People who are uh, involved in, in censorship, I think, have noticed that about themselves sometimes. That they really are into censorship to protect other people, not to protect themselves. And censors are, are fully confident of their own ability to resist whatever evils are being attacked. But they're doing it for your sake, uh, not, 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 not your own. The act looks very differently on the inside and on the outside, in its quality and in its consequences. Murder in the murderer is no such ruinous thought as poets and romancers will have it. It does not unsettle him or fright him from his ordinary notice of trifles. It is an act quite easy to be contemplated. But in its sequel, it turns out to be a horrible jangle and confounding of all relations especially the crimes that spring from love seem right and fair from the actor's point of view, but when acted are found destructive of society. No man at last believes that he can be lost or that the crime in him is as black as in the felon. This, this is very interesting. Um, the murderer has his excuses, doesn't he? And you and I look at the worst crimes and see immediate incontrovertible damnation involved. And there, there have been some really terrible things, I think, in the news in the last couple of weeks. And yet, Emerson says the certainty is that whoever is involved is able to excuse it to himself, one way or another. Um, offhand, I'm thinking about the uh, child pornography experience uh, that was uh, taking place just up uh, north of the U District. I'm sure that those two men arrested, and, and what is just the most appalling of activities, are able to sleep at night. And I think Emerson would say they are. How did they do it? that separateness of self from others that makes it possible. You mean they convince themselves that they are... That it's all right, or there is a reason for it. Because sure. they've done it. And he says murderers do it. Mm -hmm. Murderers do it. He says, we, you and I, the poets and romancers, say murder is a terrible thing, but to the murderer, 
He still gets up every morning and does his uh, does his job. Well, he does yes, he's able to justify it to himself. Because the intellect qualifies, in our own case, the moral judgment. Mm -hmm. we, we qualify or support or rationalize what we do with our intellect. For there is no crime to the intellect. That is antinomian or hypernomian and judges law as well as fact. It is worse than a crime. It is a blunder, said Napoleon, speaking the language of the intellect. Right? In other words, crime is a moral statement, but, but blunder is an intellectual one. And Napoleon says that the worst thing you can do is blunder intellectually. To be stupid, that's, that's the term. To it, the world is a problem in mathematics or the science of quantity, and it leaves out praise and blame and all weak emotions. All stealing is comparative. If you come to absolutes, pray, who does not steal? Saints are sad because they behold sin, even when they speculate, from the point of view of the conscience and not of the intellect, a confusion of thought. Sin, seen from the thought, is a diminution or less. From the conscience or will, it is gravity or bad. He's, he's, this is a very interesting conflation of intellect and morality, judgment and morality. What is sin? The moral term is evil. But in the intellect, he says, it's a lessening of possibilities, a lessening of self. The great danger for Emerson in a lot of this willingness to justify or rationalize what we would traditionally call sinful deed is that it confuses, destroys, lessens the self. Not good and bad, lessens the self. Uh, we can just call it. In a sense, he's talking to our intellects and our, our, our moral judgment. The conscience must feel it as essence, essential evil. This it is not. It has an objective existence, but no subjective. Thus, inevitably, does the universe wear our color, back to subjectiveness, whatever that is, and everything falls successively into the larger, into the subject itself. The subject exists, the subject enlarges. All things, sooner or later, fall into place. As I am, so I see. Use what language we will. We can never say anything but what we are. Hermes, Cadmus, Columbus, Newton, Bonaparte, as mine says. Instead of feeling a poverty when we encounter a great man, let us treat the newcomer like a traveling geologist who passes through our estate and shows us good slate or limestone or anthracite in our brush pasture. The partial action of each strong mind in one direction is a telescope for the objects on which it is pointed. But every other part of knowledge is to be pushed to the same extravagance ere the soul attains reduced sphericity. Sphericity? No. No. Yes. Okay. What, do, what do geniuses do for us? They pull us out. They keep us from being narrow, from being limited. They bring us to ultimate. I think, I, I don't know if he knew it, but the idea of the sphere, its roundness, is very important to Emerson. And the point about a sphere is that it's the consequence of equal forces on the inside. Uh, everything would be a sphere if there were no, uh, no limiting factors, uh, pressing it, making it oval, making it square. It would all be perfectly round. And this idea of much of our interior selves is that we allow ourselves to expand, to grow in a spherical fashion, like an orb, growing larger and larger, uh, rather than in, in narrow, one direction, limited passions. So you work, you look for genius for that purpose. I am very narrow in certain disciplines. I'd like to know more. That's my job, my task, being open to it. But every other part of knowledge is to be pushed to the same extravagance ere the soul attains her due sphericity. Do you see that kitten chasing so prettily her own tail? If you could look with her eyes, you might see her surrounded with hundreds of figures performing complex dramas with tragic and comic issues, long conversations, many characters, many ups and downs of fate. And meantime, it is only puss and her tail. <laughs> Which would it be? That's what we are, of course. We are just puss and our tail, and what we have to do is expand to see ourselves as more than that. How long before our masquerade will end its noise of tambourines, laughter and shouting, and we shall find it was a solitary performance, a subject and an object. It takes so much to make the galvanic circuit complete with magnitude and excellence. What imports it whether it is Kepler and a sphere, Columbus and America, 
a reader and a book of books in his hands. Major connections at various levels. It is true that all the muses and love and religion hate these developments and will find a way to punish the chemist who publishes in the parlor the secrets of her laboratory. Of the laboratory. And we cannot say too little of our constitutional necessity of seeing things under private aspects or saturated with our humor. In other words, we have to see things individually. That's all we can do. I'm only me and you are you. So we come to life from our own limited experiences. And yet as the God, the native, and yet is the God the native of these bleak rocks. That need makes in morals the capital virtue of self-trust. This takes us right back to the very first session last fall. Self-trust. Believe that you have that connection with being or God that gives you value. Ultimately, it's all you can have. We must hold hard to this poverty, however scandals and by more vigorous self-recoveries after the sallies of action possess our axis more firmly. The life of truth is cold and so far more important. But it is not the slave of tears, contrition, perturbation. It is not attempt another's work nor adopt another's path. It is a main lesson of wisdom to know your own and another's. I've learned that I cannot dispose of other people's facts, but I possess such a key to my own that persuades me against all their denial, but they also have to keep their own. A sympathetic person is placed in the dilemma of a swimmer among drowning men who all catch on him, and if he gives so much as a leg or a finger, they will drown him. They wish to be saved from their mischiefs, from the mischiefs of their vices, but not from their vices. Charity would be wasted on this poor waiting on the consequences. A wise and hardy physician will say, come out of that. This our talk in America. We are ruined by our good nature and listening on all sides. This complacence takes away the power of being greatly useful. Man should not be able to look other than directly, full threat. Preoccupied attention is the only answer to the importunate frivolity of other people. This is what Miss Manners said just before. You look preoccupied when somebody comes up to you with a frivolous uh, question refuse to hear frivolous questions. And attention and to an aim which makes their wants frivolous. This is a divine answer. It leaves no appeal and no hard thoughts. In Flaxman's drawing of the Eumenides of Aeschylus, Orestes supplicates Apollo whilst the furies sleep on the threshold. The face of the god expresses a shade of regret and compassion, but is calm with the conviction of the irreconcilableness of the two spheres. He is born into other politics, into the eternal and beautiful. A man at his feet asks for his interests in turmoils of the earth, in which his nature cannot enter. And the humanities there lie and express the toil of this disparity. The God is search child of his divine destiny. Independence, self-trust, self-reliance is Emerson's earlier return point. And so here we are moving to his uh, conclusion. Illusion, temperament, obsession, surface, surprise, reality, subjectiveness. These are threads in the loop of time. These are the lords of life. I dare not assume to give their order, but I name them as I find them in my way. I know better than to claim any completeness from my picture. I am a fragment, and this is the fragment of me. I can very confidently announce one or another law which throws itself into relief and form. What does relief mean here? Outline shaped like a bass relief that brings itself out of nothingness. But I am too young yet by some ages to compile a code. I gossip for my hour concerning the eternal politics. I have seen many fair pictures, not in vain. A wonderful time I have lived in. I'm not the novice I was 14, nor yet seven years ago. Yet who will ask, where is the fruit? On the private fruit sufficient. This is the fruit that I should not ask for a rash effect of meditation, counsels, and hiding the truth. This is Emerson's ask, speaking out to people who said, hey, you've been at this for 20 years? What have you got out of it? Right? This is I'm different from what I was seven years ago, 14 years ago, 20 years ago. And when you say, uh, what have you got out of all your thinking? He says, uh, well, this is the fruit. I don't ask for immediate fruit. I don't, I don't hurry it along. I have 
faith that things will come of their own accord. I should feel it pitiful to demand a result on this town and country, an overt effect on the instant month and year. The effect is deep and secular as the cause. It works on periods in which mortal lifetime is lost. All I know is reception. I am and I have, but I do not get. And when I have fancied I have gotten the things, I found I did not. I worship with wonder the great fortune. My reception has been so large. But I am not annoyed by receiving this or that superabundantly. I say to the genius, if you will pardon the proverb, for a mill, for a mill. Also, that hankering after an overt or pr practical effect seems to me an apostasy. What do you want? My desire for prudence. In good earnest, I am willing to spare this most unnecessary deal of doing. Life wears to me a visionary face. Hardest, roughest action is visionary also. It is but a choice between soft and turbulent dreams. People disparage knowing and the intellectual life and urge doing. I am very content with knowing. If only I could know. There's a, you, you know who he's talking to at that point? He's talking to Thoreau and all the people who criticize him for not being out there. <coughs> that doesn't, if I could know what I was doing, I would be satisfied with that. If I could know what I was knowing. I could know. That is an august entertainment that would suffice me a great while. To know a little would be worth it the expense of this world. Down in the middle of the next paragraph. Why not realize your own world? But far be from me the despair which prejudges the law by a faulty empiricism. Since there never was a right endeavor, but it succeeded. The patience, the patience, we shall win at the last. Can you hear the preacher? Stick with it. Even knowing all of this, all of these uh, limitations we go through, we must be very suspicious of the deceptions of the element of time. It takes a good deal of time to eat or to sleep or to earn a hundred dollars and a very little time to entertain a hope and an insight which becomes the light of our life. We dress our garden, eat our dinners, discuss the household with our wives, and these things make no impression are forgotten next week. But in the solitude to which every man is always returning, he has a sanity and re revelation, which in his passage into new worlds he will carry with him. Never mind the ridicule, never mind the defeat. Up again, old heart, it seems to say, there is victory yet for all justice, and the true romance which the world exists to realize will be the transformation of genius into practical power. And you notice how he he pushes all these big words together. The transformation is a change, and then genius and power coming together, if you have it. I think for me, the uh, the main attractiveness of Emerson is always...